Good morning. We'll start by reading from Mark chapter 8. And we'll start in verse 31. Mark chapter 8, verse 31. <clears throat> He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chiefs, or chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned, looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then he called the crowd along him, or crowd to him along with his disciples and said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Whatever, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in his adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes to his Father's glory with, uh, with the holy angels. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for each and every one of us that's here this morning. We pray that we each hear whatever we need to hear right now. Um, whether we're already believers and, and have that, or if this is the first time hearing the gospel, we pray, Lord, that you'll give us exactly what we need. We pray that you'll be with Joe this morning, that his message be pure and simply your truth. We know, Lord, that you're with us this morning. We thank you for that. We thank you for your love, for the grace that you've shown your people. And we pray all of this in your name. Amen. Now we'll sing the hymn of the day inside the cover of the bulletin, and we'll stand as we sing.
take out your hymnals and turn them to number 337. Teach me thy way, O Lord, number 337. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Now, what Eric read is the same thing we're going to read in Matthew, it's just Mark's version of it. The Lord chose four men to write what we commonly refer to as the Gospels. And uh, the first three of them, often referred to as the Synoptic Gospels, cover much of the same information. And yet, if we compare them, that is, read these stories from all three accounts, we pick up different details. Now, why God didn't um, inspire just one of them to give the whole story all at once? I don't know. But then there's a lot of things God does that I don't know why he did it that way, but I assume it was wise. But let's read it as Matthew has recorded this, these same um, words by our Lord in Matthew 16. <clears throat> and it begins in verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then said Jesus to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. 
For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. <clears throat> but whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory <clears throat> with his angels. And then he will reward each person according to what he has done. I tell you the truth. Some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now you can take out your hymnals again and turn them to number 67. How can it be? Number 67, and we'll stand as we sing. we've got our more or less primitive <laughs> equipment back up here again. The, the, the camera that we bought for live streaming and used it last week did a really nice job so far as capturing a picture and streaming it, but I found out it had a defect in it. And essentially it's, um, well, if it's pointing directly at me, I'm not in the middle of the picture. Not that that's a terribly important issue, but if you try to zoom in and out on it, which that camera can do, you start to zoom in and I just kind of slide clear out of the picture. 
and I called them about it and what they figured was wrong. I wouldn't be able to fix it, so it's been sent back and we'll get another one. I don't know if it'll be before next week. I hope so, because it sure makes doing all this stuff much more simple than having to work with this thing. But we'll do the best we can. Now, if you'll turn back to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Now, what we read earlier in Matthew, and our brother read it from the book of Mark, it's also found in Luke chapter 9. It appears in all three of what are called the Synoptic Gospels. And for this reason, we must consider it one of our Lord's more important exhortations. Now, even as I wrote that word exhortations down in my notes, I thought, there's going to be young people here that have no idea what an exhortation is. In fact, you probably don't hear the word outside of church. It's just that kind of word. But you young'uns, I'll tell you what an exhortation is. It means to strongly urge someone to do something. But that may even sound a little bit more grown up than you're used to hearing. So let me give you an example. Your parents might say, time for homework. Well, that's just a statement of fact. That's not an exhortation. But if they say, you must get your homework done or you will fail that class and have to take it over again, that's an exhortation. <laughs> they are giving you information and by giving you that information, they're trying to persuade you to take some kind of action. That's an exhortation. And our Lord here in this passage is giving information and persuading his disciples to act upon what they have heard. Now, James speaks to us along this fashion, faith without deeds is vain being dead. And what does he mean by that? Well, claiming to believe something means nothing if you don't take action on it. It's like if someone told you, um, I've got a surefire investment. You put a thousand dollars, you invest a thousand dollars in this enterprise, and uh, I guarantee you in 10 years, it'll be worth a million bucks. Now you can believe that person as much as you want. You can be utterly convinced that what he said is true. But if you don't put $1,000 in that investment, your faith was vain, being dead. And our Lord here is giving instruction and then showing us what action this instruction should produce in us. And the fact is, if we say, I believe the instruction, but then we never do the action, it means that our faith in the instruction is vain being dead. People say folks ought to act according to what they believe. <laughs> Everyone does. Everyone does. What you truly count valuable and what you truly believe in, that is what you're pursuing. Therefore, some, um, to, in a general sense, a person could look at what you're pursuing, what drives your life, and they can determine then what you trust in. Now this exhortation concerns following Christ. He says here <clears throat> in verse 24, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now that's the exhortation. That's the action based upon the instruction that he gives a few verses back. Now this whole lesson begins with this instruction. Look back up at verse 21. From that time on, 
Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Now, <clears throat> Mark adds to this, you know, uh, where Matthew says, from that time on, and then Mark adds this, he taught them plainly about this. You know, in the Old Testament, this was taught. In fact, our Lord said to some disciples on the day of his resurrection, later that evening, as they were on the road to Emmaus, he says, didn't you understand that the Christ must suffer? And it was in the, it's in the Old Testament. It, uh, Isaiah 53 is one of the most notable examples of it when it talks about uh, who has believed our report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness that when we should see him we would desire him. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows yet we did esteem him stricken smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way but the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now that's suffering, grief, sorrow, punishment. All these things were prophesied in the Old Testament but not in such a way that many people understood it. So the Lord begins here to plainly tell his disciples what's going to happen. His suffering was necessary. You say, why? Well, first of all, his suffering is necessary because God ordained it. Now, I don't mean he just said, well, if there's going to be salvation, it has to be th this way. He said, this is what's going to happen. We believe that God is in sovereign control of all things, that all things that happen, happen because God ordained that they would happen, and they happen in fulfillment of His will and in order to accomplish His purpose, which is, is, is the salvation of His people through Jesus Christ. And <clears throat> in uh, Acts chapter 1, when Peter is uh, speaking to there on the, excuse me, Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, when Peter is preaching the gospel, the first time the gospel was preached, after it had been fulfilled, and the Holy Spirit had come upon the apostles in order to enable them to preach it, and he says to them, you, according to the foreordained purpose of God, have with wicked hands, killed the Lord of glory. People say, well, you say God ordained sin? Well, that's the worst sin that was ever done. When men raised their hands against Christ, they were shaking their fist in the face of God. And yet God ordained it, and by uh, something that only God can do, he took that which was the most grievous sin, worse than Adam's sin, worse than Adam's sin, he, was, he ordained that sin. Men from their own wicked hearts and with their own wicked hands carried it out. And yet all of it was done to bring about God's purpose of salvation. And it couldn't be avoided. Now don't get the idea because God foreordained it. There were Jews saying, I really don't want to say cruci crucify him, crucify him, but I just can't help him. Crucify him, crucify him. I'm wanting to stop, but I can't crucify No, it wasn't like that. They loved what they were doing. They chose to do it. But God ordained it. That Roman nailing him to a cross had no reluctance whatsoever. Maybe took a, a certain measure of grim satisfaction in it. And a sense of power. But all that happened because God ordained it. Our Lord Jesus came into this world 
on a mission. His mission was not to set himself a throne over there in Jerusalem. It was not to topple over Herod or Pontius Pilate or even the emperor of Rome. He said on the day of his crucifixion, my kingdom's not of this world. And that's why he didn't mess with anybody in this world. That's why he did not fight like the people of this world fight. He came in to establish a spiritual and eternal kingdom, a heavenly kingdom. And he came into this world headed to the cross. The cross is not plan B. It's not even plan A, subsection B. He is called the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Before God called this universe into existence, it had already been determined that Jesus Christ would be born at such and such a time and that he would die in the place of God's people on such and such a day by such and such a method. He must because it's been ordained. He must suffer these things because if he does not suffer, there is no salvation. If he is not rejected by those who are very religious but very much in rebellion against God, if he's not rejected by them, then that means he's one of them. And we cannot be saved by someone who's one of us. Our Savior must come from outside of us. He must be rejected. He must be killed. Why? Well, the law puts it this way. It's the blood that makes atonement for the soul. If there's to be an atonement, somebody's got to die. The book of Hebrews recites much the same thing when it says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Now, you and I have a great deal of sins. God's people, though chosen in Him before the foundation of the world, yet they come into this world exactly like everybody else, carrying within them that poisonous um, the blood of Adam, having within them what theologians like to call original sin, but it simply means we are born sinners. David said, I was conceived in sin and shapen in iniquity. And he did not mean by that that the, uh, the act of his parents in conceiving him was sinful. It meant the moment he was conceived, he was a sinner. Why? Because of who his parents were and who their parents were and their parents were all the way back to Adam. We come into this world sinners and it doesn't take long before we prove what we are. Once again, David said, I came from, forth from the womb speaking lies. Someone says, well, how does someone come forth from the womb speaking lies when he can't speak at all? They can cry a lie. A cry is supposed to mean you need something, that you're hurting. It's supposed to be an indication to those that, to those that care for you that you need attention. But anybody that's had children knows this. Sometimes they cry just because they want to cry. Sometimes they cry just because they want attention and they know that that usually gets it. And so there's nothing wrong with them. But they say there's something wrong with them. And the lie of self-salvation, the lie of self-righteousness, it's born in our hearts. And the moment we get the opportunity to make any declaration about ourselves, it will be some kind of justification of ourselves. You know, it, it's hard sometimes when you're raising little children because you see this principle and they say things that are just so funny because they think it's going to work. They're self-justifying deception and our grandson, Carter, and his brother, Logan. Well, Logan started crying. Of course, Carter's the bigger and older one. So you assume right away something happened. And Mary asked, and he said, well, well I accidentally spanked him. If it's an accident, it's okay, you know. How do you accidentally spank somebody? See what I mean? The lie. 
And, 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 and we laugh about that in kids because it is kind of cute. But what it is, besides being cute and funny, <laughs> what it is is proof of, of what the scriptures say about us. We are sinners from birth, liars from the day we were conceived, and all we need is the opportunity to speak, and we'll start telling lies. And most of all, we'll tell lies about our own goodness. We will justify ourselves. I thank you, God, I'm not like other men, said the Pharisees. And he was exactly like other men. We're sinners, and only blood puts away sin. And he must be raised to life. Because of the Apostle Paul, because Apostle Paul said, brethren, if Christ is not raised, we'll not be raised. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, then we are of all men most miserable. The resurrection, and I've said this before, the resurrection is not so much an event in itself. It's actually just the beginning of his return to his place at the right hand of the Father. And he made a stop for 40 days here to give some final instructions. But him being raised from the dead was God's seal of approval upon his work. That the sins he bore, he'd actually borne them away. And since he bore them away, he no longer bore them. Now, Peter says he bore our sins in his body on the tree. But that by the time they took him off of that tree... He had borne those sins away. There was no sin on him, no sin in him. It wasn't there. That's why he could say to that thief, today you'll be with me in paradise. He didn't die on the cross and then go to some place of punishment and be punished for the three days and three nights he spent in the grave and then get out. No, he said it is finished, and when he said that, it really was done. He had fully borne our sins and borne them away. They were gone. He didn't bear them. And three days later, God gave us his testimony that indeed that was the case. He no longer bore sin, and the grave is a place for sinners, not for righteous people. So he, rose, he raised his son from the dead. So these things must come to pass because God ordained them. They must come to pass because they are necessary to the salvation of God's people. Without these things happening, there would be no reason for you and I to meet together like this Sunday morning. We might as well be out doing what our flesh told us this morning we'd rather be doing anyway. Whatever it is that may have given you a little resistance to come this morning, may as well have been doing that if these things never happened. That's how important this matter is. And that's why he began to speak it plainly. And from that point on. Now, he was killed. Not as a martyr. Not as an example. But as a sacrifice. If he was a martyr, it would have to be said that his life was taken from him. But he said, no man takes my life from me. I lay it down. I lay it down. He's not a martyr. And while we may find a certain example out of his willingness to die for his people, yet that was not his primary purpose. Because after all, we cannot die for anyone else like he died for all his people. I can't die as your substitute. You know, if a man were found guilty of a crime in a court of law, a capital offense, and they put him to death, and then it was found, lo and behold, somebody else did it, and they caught that man, do you think they would let that man go free? Saying, well, we already killed one. Wouldn't be right to charge somebody else with a crime. No, not in this world, and it shouldn't be that way. 
They should be extremely sorry that they got it wrong with the first guy, but justice is justice, and one guy cannot die in the place of another and put that person's crime away. And therefore, the, the man who really did it, when they catch him and try him and convict him, they should execute him. Why? Because the wrongful execution of the first man did not put away the crime of the second man. But when Jesus Christ, and beloved, I tell you, this is, this is what will give strength to your heart if you can lay hold of it. The Bible says it's good for the heart to be strengthened with grace. Here's some grace. Jesus Christ, dying in the place of the sinner, put away the sins of the sinner so that the sinner never bears them. And God in his justice is satisfied. When Paul was in Romans 8 was talking about the certainty of our salvation, he says, Who is he that condemns? It is Christ who died. Yea, rather, is risen again. You'll notice that it does not say, Who is he that condemns? All of these people believed. Now, I know that the unbelieving shall be condemned. But I also know this. The believing shall not be justified on the foundation of their faith. Rather, they are justified on the foundation of the object of their faith, which is Christ and Him crucified. It's Christ's death that put away the sin of His people. Therefore, we can say this, all for whom Christ died shall receive the fullness of God's salvation. As Paul later said in Romans chapter 8, he who spared not his own son, but, free, but de freely delivered him up or delivered him up for us all. And that's one of those alls that you've got to take within the context of, of what he's speaking there. Shall he not with him freely give us all things? Now what's that saying? If it's saying nothing else, it's saying this. Everyone for whom God gave the Savior as a sacrifice, every one of them will receive all things which are in Christ. Our Lord put it this way, that there was a people that belonged to the Father. The Father gave them to the Son. And the Son says, and I will not lose one of them. Not one. Now my soul can rest in that. Why? Because that tells my soul the work is done. The Lord Jesus Christ did not do a work that awaited my approval. The Lord Jesus Christ did not do a work that got me 99 and 99 one hundredths percent of the way there. But there's some little thing I've yet got to do to finish the work of Christ. Jesus Christ said it is finished and that means whatever he came to do it was done. And he told us what he came to do. He said, I've come to give my life a ransom for many. He said, I've come for God's sheep. I've come to seek and to save that which is lost. He said, well, everybody's lost. No, they aren't. Just ask them. I guarantee you, every lost person is going to get saved. <laughs> We're going to get found. Let me put it that way. Every lost person is going to get found. Why? The shepherd, good shepherd's looking for him. And he's not going to lose one. He's not going to say, well, it's only one out of a hundred. I mean, come on. How much effort should I put out to go find this one silly lost sheep? He'll put out all the effort that God could put out to find him. And that'll be enough. He found you, didn't he? He was raised again to prove the validity of his work. Well, Peter objected to this. 
Peter took him aside. Sometimes I can identify so well with Peter. He opened his mouth way before he should have. <laughs> He's one of these guys, as soon as a thought popped in his mind, it came out of his mouth. And let's face it, to the eye of the flesh, that didn't look like a very good program, did it? The master be killed? The Savior die? How's he going to save anybody if he's dead? And so Peter, you know, and I'm sure Peter didn't realize what an act of self-righteous condescension this was on his part. So they like, Lord, come over here now, come on. <laughs> That's just not going to happen. You know me. I got a sword. And I'm a fisherman. I got some strong arms. Now, that's just, you just put that out of your mind. And on the one hand, we might say that that statement came out of Peter's love for the Lord Jesus Christ. His concern for the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what that shows us? That Satan can even make use of what otherwise might be virtues to bring about something awful. Because the Lord looked at him, he looked to Peter and he said, get behind me, Satan. Can you imagine what Peter felt like when the Lord said that? You're calling me the devil? Well, the devil was using him. You are a stumbling block to me. You're getting in the way. You're making this thing even more difficult. I know our Lord is God. I don't understand altogether how that can be, but I know that he lived his life here entirely as a man. The book of Philippians says that he <clears throat> humbled himself. He surrendered his divine rights and privileges, humbled himself. And though by nature he was God, he took upon the nature of man. And he came here and you know something? Pain to him was pain. Hunger was hunger. Thirst was thirst. Death was death. He did not say, well, I'm going to go to the cross. Look, it's just a three-day thing. I can, I can deal with anything for three days. No. As he faced the cross and all that it meant, it says in the Garden of Gethsemane, that so great was his stress that he was sweating blood. There's a medical con condition. I think it's called hematidrosis. But you can be under such stress that the blood vessels in your pores break. And therefore, as you sweat with the sweat that goes with stress, blood comes with it. That's how distressed our Lord was about this. And he begins to plainly tell about it. And Satan says, here's an opportunity to get in the way of the Lord. Because he knew if he can stop this, if he can stop that crucifixion, then, then there will be no salvation. Jesus Christ will not be glorified and the whole thing's going to fall down. And so he enters, as it were, the mind or uses the natural mind of Peter and his love and affection for Christ and he moves Peter to get in the way of the Lord. And the Lord recognized who was really operating right there. He didn't really call Peter Satan. He looked at Peter and what Peter was doing and recognized who was using Peter. And he said, you get behind me. Don't you dare stand between me and the cross. This is a difficult enough path. You savor the things of men, not the things of God. Jesus said to his disciples, Mark says that he said not only to his disciples, but he turned the, the whole crowd following him. You can hear him as he lifts up his voice, because I'm sure what he said to Peter there, probably only Peter heard it. But he speaks up loud enough, and he says, and, and this is based on what he said about what he must endure. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now this thing called the Christian life is nothing like what most 
religious Christians think it is. It's probably not a whole lot like what we think it is because we are not only reborn spirit, we still got this flesh and it's still interjecting all of its thoughts in there, but it'll read something like this and said, yes, if we want to follow Christ, we've got to become radical about Jesus. Well, you know something? They're right if you understand what the word radical means. The radical, our word radical comes from the same Latin word as the word root. And to be radical means to get at the root of things. And indeed, whoever follows Christ, whoever would follow after Christ, is getting at the real root of the issue. He's getting to the root of the problem that he has. Now, the world is perfectly happy to deal with the superficial aspects of the problem that men have. That is, the sins that they commit, which are merely the symptoms or fruit of the sin that is within them. But they think if they can get you to quit drinking, and they can quit you to quit carousing, and quit stealing, and quit lying, and they're working on getting you to stop doing these things, and it's a good thing if you can stop doing them, but, uh, well, I believe in God's sovereignty, so saying good luck with that wouldn't make sense, but you know what I mean. We struggle with it, don't we? And we never get any of these practices put away once and for all. But they're, most of the religious world is happy with the superficial. The believer in Christ is concerned about the root of the matter, which is in him. And he wants to, someone to fix the problem in him, knowing that if God fixes the problem in him, in time, all the symptoms will likewise go away. That won't happen till we die or till the Lord comes back. But sooner or later, us in sin will have no relationship whatever. And so we're radicals in that way. But most people, when they say radical these days, what they're meaning is fanatical, kind of acting crazy, or utterly consumed with a certain thing. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ does not call us to that kind of fanaticism. Now, there are some within the kingdom of God who God has called to such a level of devotion of their time and energy that we might call them fanatics. And that's fine. But that's not what our Lord means here. When he says, if anyone come up, would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. That's not what he's talking about. If it is, I've met only a handful of people in this world that would qualify there. And I'll be honest with you, I'm not among them. You say, well, you're a pastor. Yes. But I'm not as energetic in my work as I might be. I'm not real fanatic, fanatical about much anything. I'm radical. I'm radical in the sense for all the time that I've been here, I've been preaching the same thing, getting at the root of the matter. But I'm not fanatical, and the Lord's not talking about fanaticism. Here's what he's talking about. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself. Self-deny. Now you say self-denial among most religious people, and that says, right, we've got to live lives of poverty. And you've got uh, certain people that uh, they get into, they think that they're going to be especially useful to Jesus Christ in this kingdom, and they take on a vow of poverty. Well, you know, Abraham is called the father of the faithful. He is held up before us as someone who is a believer and an example of a believer. And yet he was a very wealthy man. So was Job. So was David and Solomon. There have been many people in this world who you'd call them both radical and fanatical 
about the things of God, and yet they were wealthy people. So when he's talking about self-denial, he's not talking about taking a vow of poverty or denying yourself uh, innocent pleasures in this life. Men enter the ministry in some religions and they take a vow of celibacy. And I'm thinking, if you've got to take a vow in order to accomplish it, don't try. If celibacy is not natural to you, don't try for it because you're not going to make it. We aren't built that way. Say, well, Paul says a man should remain married, uh, excuse me, unmarried. Yes, and then he said, but if he burns, (laughs) let him get married. What's that saying? If it presents a problem to a man to be single, let him get married. His only idea at that time was that if a fellow is going to be in the ministry, if he can do it as a single man and not have the care and concern, that is a traveling ministry such as Paul and the apostles and them had. He said if he can have it without the concerns of taking care of a family, that's better. No, people think to deny themselves means somehow or another to make themselves miserable. But many who are, think that they're denying themselves for the cause of Christ are doing, the exactly the, or doing exactly the opposite of what this scripture means. For to deny yourself as the Lord is using it here means to deny yourself as worthy of God's salvation or capable of doing anything which would earn a blessing from him. And he puts that first. (laughs) Why? Because no one will ever lay hold of Christ until he set himself down. No one will ever trust Christ until he quits trusting himself. Now look over at Philippians chapter 3 and I'll show you that in the life of Paul. Philippians chapter 3. Paul in the first six verses... Well, actually, starting in verse um, 4, he says, Though I myself have reason for such confidence, what he means by that is there are people who have confidence in their own flesh and what they've done in the flesh. And he said, but really, if anybody can say that they have a right to confidence in the flesh, I can. And he gives his pedigree, all the things he had done as a Pharisee in Judaism. A Pharisee was a radical, fanatical Jew. <laughs> he gives all of that. And then he says in verse 7, But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything lost compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things and consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ. What all things was he talking about? That pedigree. That Hebrew of Hebrews, circumcised on the eighth day. As zeal, touching zeal, persecuting the church. As touching that righteousness which is in the law, I was blameless. That was Saul of Tarsus, and he had to be denied. And all of us come into this world thinking we got something, and we don't. And we got to learn to deny ourselves and all hope in ourselves and all goodness in ourselves. And quit thinking we're somebody and that God's especially pleased with us and he's more pleased with us than he is that guy over there because we do this and he doesn't. And then we don't do that, but he does. That's what it is to deny yourself. And nobody can do that without the grace of God. Really, they can't. Everybody everybody without the grace of God is self-righteous even if they appear to be one of the nicest people you've ever met, within their heart is that wickedness of self-righteousness. Deny yourself. Take up his cross. Paul enlightens us on what that means in Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. He says there, May I never boast 
except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. What does the cross symbolize? It symbolizes being cut off from the world, all of it, to being cursed. Paul says by the cross, the world no longer had regard for him and he no longer had regard for the world. Didn't mean he didn't love the people in it. But that whole way of natural human life particularly as it pertains to the worship of God. You're not to make any difference. They could say to Paul, why, Paul, you're a sinner. And he'd say, well, you think you're telling me something new, something I didn't already know? But this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of which I am the chief. See, the world couldn't embarrass Paul about his sin. Because he confessed it long before they ever accused him of it. They couldn't say, now you quit preaching or we're going to kill you. Okay, I don't count my life dear to me. I only want this, that I can finish my course. That's the only thing I'm interested in. See, the world didn't mean anything to him. He could enjoy what it had so long as the Lord gave it to him, but... He was not of the world, and neither is any believer. They're not of this world. They're in it. They live within it and participate in some of the things it does, but they're not of it. Take up his cross. And what it is it to take up our cross? Well, actually, it comes out this way. To take up our cross means primarily, if not altogether, to... Take up his cross as our only glory and our only hope. It's to bear his cross before the world. And when they say such things as they commonly say to believers, well, you all think that a person can sin all they want and go to heaven. You can say, look, I already sin more than I want, but thank God I'm going to heaven anyway. They'll say things like, well, yeah, Jesus Christ died, but he died for everybody. And it's up to you to accept or reject his sacrifice. And you say to them, listen, I can't accept or reject his sacrifice because it was never offered to me. It was offered to God, and God accepted it. And he sent his spirit to testify to its power within my heart. And he let me know that when Christ died, he died for me. The old hymn writer said, this is my hope, this is my plea, that when Christ died, he died for me. And me making that my hope and my plea is not what made it effective for me. Rather, him dying for me set in motion a whole series of events that led to me saying, Jesus Christ is my hope and plea. Take up his cross. That doesn't mean you do like that one guy. Well, several did it, but the first guy that did it, I think his name was Arthur Blessed. And he fashioned himself one of those traditional looking crosses. And for the sake of his own ease, he put wheels on the end of it so he could walk around with it, trying to act like Jesus Christ carrying his cross on crucifixion day. Besides it not being an accurate representation of what it meant to pick up a cross. All that they were required to carry was a cross beam. But to think that the Lord intended for us to fashion something shaped like a, the traditional looking cross and drag it around. That that somehow is what it is to take up our cross and follow him. No, that's to be part of the world. You're saying, look at me. Look at me. See how devoted I am? I'm a big C Christian. Maybe all capital letters. No, sir. Taking up 
His cross means denying yourself, any good in yourself, any value in yourself, any hope in yourself. Taking up your cross, which is nothing other than His cross trusted in by you. And following Him as one who did not care what the world thought. But submitting oneself to God and to His Son. It's not that hard to get people to dedicate their lives to Jesus. And when that doesn't work, they can rededicate them and rededicate them and get them to make vows and promises. People love to do that. Why? It's something they can glory in. There's nothing in the gospel for you to glory in. But it says here, For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. For whoever loses his life for me, and Mark or Luke, I can't remember which one, adds the words, and my gospel, will find it. That isn't talking about dying necessarily, though some did. Some have. It's gone to that point. But it means you simply give up on yourself. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faithfulness of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's what it is to die to self, to take up your cross and follow Christ. And it says there's going to be a time when the Lord returns in his Father's glory with his angels, and he'll reward everyone according to what he's done. Say, so, wait a minute, that just sounded like we suddenly took a U-turn. No, you, again, everything's got to be determined within its context. He'll reward everyone according to this. Did you deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him? Or did you love the world's approval more than the ridicule or more than the gospel knowing that you'd be ridiculed by the world for it? Did you love what the world has so much that you were unwilling to forsake it and forsake what you are? in order that you may win Christ and be found in Him not having a righteousness of your own, which is by the law. It's not going to be a judgment about whether you cheated or not or whether you lied or not or whether you did this or that and all the sins that people talk about. He will reward everyone according to this. Who did you trust? Yourself or God? Or Christ. Because right now, you're trusting one of them. Right now, this minute, everybody here who's old enough to think about these kind of things is trusting himself, something he's done or hopes he'll be able to do, or he's trusting Christ for what he's already done. And when the Lord returns, everyone will be re- Divided into two camps, self-trusters, Christ-trusters. The self-trusters will get exactly what they deserve according to what they have done. And all the Christ-trusters will say, I'm not getting what I deserve. I'm getting the reward that Christ earned and gives to me freely by grace. You ought to be ready to deny yourself because Paul said, I realized I was just a bunch of rubbish anyway. You might as well throw it out. Deny yourself. Take up the cross as your only hope. Make his cross your cross and follow him. And if you do, just like him, you'll suffer. Not to the degree he did, but you'll suffer some from the world. 
But just as his suffering led to his glory, so will your suffering lead to everlasting glory in the presence of the Father. The Lord bless his word. Take out your hymnals and turn them to number 222. 222, there is a fountain, and we'll stand as we sing. Yeah. 